Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent acts and injury. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Okay, Wendy, we've got a fantastic case for the listeners this time that they're going to enjoy. And it's so full of detail that it's going to take two episodes to really cover this comfortably. And it'll release on our every other Tuesday schedule that we use, which is a reminder that when people go to their podcast player and their platform, not only subscribe to us, but check that little doohickey button that says auto download so that you know that when you get up on Tuesday morning, this episode and the one that follows will be there for you. Go ahead and tell the listeners what this is about. This case is just crazy, I will tell you. It has been captivating ever since I learned about it. It's the 1986 murder of a 22-year-old young man by the name of Michael Turpin. It occurred in Lexington, Kentucky. Now, this case, it originally was reported as a missing person case. And Detective Fran Root received that call, and Fran walks us through detail by detail of the case up until it gets prosecuted by Ray the DA Larson. And it's about greed and what happens when three evil people collide to create this perfect storm. Yeah, that collision for that perfect storm is what got me about it, too, is that you usually see activity like with one person, maybe a couple people, but The listeners are going to see what it's like when when somehow you get three people together that have the same mindset and carry out a very evil act. And the details are important because this case, like a lot of them we do, was covered nationally. For example, Oxygen Network did a really good job with it. But here's the difference. We have more time and we have Fran's undivided attention and the details he's going to offer are unique to what you see on television. Yeah, the details with Fran, he walks you through literally from the moment he got that call, step by step, and you truly feel like you are there envisioning and you can see everything Fran's describing. So it is really a sad case, but just bizarre on all all areas. So with that being said, let's dig right in and learn a little bit about this case involving Mr. Michael Turpin. Hey there, Fran. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Joining Fran and me is retired District Attorney Ray Larson, affectionately known as Ray the DA. Ray, how are you over there? I'm doing well, Wendy. We are also joined by former homicide investigator and retired police commander, my husband, David Lyons. David, how are you over there? Doing great. Can't wait to hear this story in detail. Well, with that being said, let's get started. Fran, won't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I was one of these guys that graduated from high school without a clue as to what I wanted to do. Uh, I'm working in the family grocery store over in Chevy Chase, and uh, we get robbed. And so during the course of that investigation, I got to meet detectives with the Lexington Police Department, and they even actually took me with them a couple times to go down to headquarters and do things. And it was just a light bulb exploding in my head that I I can do this. I want to do this. And so, uh, you know, you got to be 21 to do this. And, of course, I just come out of high school, so I got my butt back into school. Uh, got hired as soon as I turned 21 and went into the police academy at Lexington. Uh, I didn't spend much time on the street as I got drafted into the detective bureau work general assignment, which included homicides back then, and, uh, and then went into special investigations, which also included homicides back then. Uh, so you got a little taste of everything. Uh, and then by the time I got about eight years down as a detective, 
detective. I went back out to patrol for a few years, and finally I made sergeant and, and immediately came back into the detective bureau and took over the robbery homicide squad. Fran, so you went from being a detective out to patrol. It means you're wearing a uniform and on the street. What do you learn on patrol as opposed to as a detective in a police agency? Well, I ended up doing a lot of teaching when I was out on patrol. People would call me all the time asking advice, help me do a search warrant or those kind of things. Uh, so I really enjoyed that part. Now, the bad part was is I had never worked under the modern investigation of, of car accidents. And so they gave me every car wreck the first night I was out. And uh, and finally, I had to call the dispatcher and tell them, okay, cut off the car accidents. I know how to work them now. So you go through, you do time on the street, and you serve your time as a detective. And and I'm guessing that's what you were doing when this, this uh, missing person case came yes. to be. Did you get that call yourself? Yes, uh, I was called in. Uh, that morning on February 3rd, early 1985, which is the end of 1985, is when I went into the robbery homicide as, as their squad sergeant. And, uh, it had five homicides that year. 1986, uh, we went into 26 homicides for the year. So, uh, before that, we had only averaged around 17 or so, uh, even less than that most of the time. So, uh, it was a sink or swim year, in other words. And this was early in the year, being in February. Back during that time frame, what do you think uh, that increase in homicides was attributed to in Lexington? I don't know that you can attribute it. I remember later on in 1986, uh, a reporter asked me how my how my homicide prevention program was working, and I just had to laugh and said, "We have no homicide prevention program." Although, on retrospect, I think we did uh, to a great extent, just dealing with domestic violence situations. You know how many homicides are domestic, and and when when you enforce the laws right off the bat, then perhaps you it doesn't get carried away to the homicide stage. One of the interesting things about 1986 <clears throat> was with the number of 26 homicides, there was one evening that five homicides occurred. And that's a case that we will hopefully deal with at some point. And Fran was in charge of the investigation of that as well. So that elevated the numbers pretty quickly. Yes. So with this, you're just sitting at your desk. How's it work? You just get a no, call? No, I'm still and... at home at, at this point, And they, they call me at home. Uh, this, I think we normally work somewhere uh, before 9 o'clock. And, and this was uh, probably around 7 that I get called. Just said we've got a missing person and... Right. What do you usually do then? Just start looking or? Oh, yeah. I, I go on and respond to the scene. Uh, it's really up to the patrol officer. You know, he's he's dispatched on a routine call to take a missing person report. Well, Officer Bird arrives at that scene and he takes a look around and there's a considerable amount of blood in the entryway to the apartment. So he uses his discretion at that time and, and asks headquarters to call out robbery homicide. Specifically, what day did this occur and around what time do you think that call? This is a Monday morning, right at the beginning of the work week. And what day uh, of the year was it? Just to make sure we're clear on that. Oh, it, it was February 3rd of 1986, Monday. So, so you get up and you go over to the apartment and you're just going to start looking for this Mr. Turpin. Well, it, I confirm that there's enough to the scene to call in the identification detectives to start processing it. Uh, now, what does that mean, Fran? Well, that means that we... We are lucky enough to have specialized people that are highly trained on how to gather evidence and document evidence and document a crime scene. And so uh, you call them as just as quick as you know that you need them uh, because really you don't want to be messing around the crime scene any before they get there and they can get started. So you look around and you see this blood and, and what what happens next? Well, Pretty much next uh, is after the 
the crime scene investigators get there that I had my first opportunity to talk to the uh, victim's wife. Uh, she was next door getting cleaned up uh, at the apartment, and, and so I was introduced to, to Elizabeth Turpin at that time. So I'm guessing like most wives, she was just frantic, not knowing where her husband was and where this blood was from. And did she not even, was she not there to, to know that there was blood or that he was missing? Well, that's that's the thing with her is that she gave me a whole lot of reason right off the bat to be suspicious of her. Uh, she had not spent the night there. She had spent the night out carousing with friends and, uh, and said and told me just a diatribe of reasons why she didn't come back home, said that it was raining in her car fishtail and she had a wheel out of balance and she doesn't see well in the rain. Just all kinds of things like that, just about why she didn't come home. Then it's later on that I get a little bit more that raises my suspicions up again. So I'm I'm dealing with her. Then I also get to deal with the other people at the scene while the detectives are, are working it and doing a neighborhood canvas, that type of thing. I, and apparently Elizabeth had called both her mother and father-in-laws over to the scene and telling them about Mike being missing and there's blood there. You know, you your conversation now talks to instincts that you develop as a detective or a police officer. And you said that you had suspicions. Why did you have suspicions right away? Well, we're pretty well trained in Lexington, and, and I had already had quite a bit of training in statement analysis and interview and interrogation. And, and you know that when someone is giving you too much information uh, in a varied way and they're just regurgitating it, you're not – getting it out of them. Uh, you're just getting this long explanation uh, that's going to raise your hackle some and you're going to pay more attention. What was what was Elizabeth's demeanor during uh, this period of time? Well, and, and when do you mention something about her being distraught? She wasn't. Uh, she was, uh, and, and that didn't, that in itself didn't alarm me only because I have seen people in shock and, and, uh, and they can go pretty quiet and, and, uh, expressionless and everything. But, but no, she was matter of fact, she was later on, we kind of figured that, uh, she was, uh, kind of basking in it. I'm going to call mom. I'm going to call dad and I'm going to call Mike's friends and. She's just at the center of attention, trying to let everybody know first that she's, she's, you know, reaching out. So she's in control here. That was the early onset of, of what we determined. And of course, as this case went on and even going to trial, she proved that more and more. So you're just, so she's, you're just interviewing with her and she's going on and on about all her myriad of reasons why she couldn't come home and, and. I guess that coupled with her not being distraught, do you at that point continue to question her or did she even have an idea of where maybe he could have been or how this blood got there? Well, generally some of the first things that you do is is you explain that you're going to need a formal interview with her and, uh, and any witness that has something to lend to the case. And so we were just really killing time until I got a chance to break away from the scene and transport her down to the office to, to have her give a formal statement. Why do you go to the office to interview people like that? Because that, that's kind of a typical thing. I want you to go downtown with us and give a statement. Is what yes. You're, you're avoiding distractions that way is probably the key. Uh, you're also much more in control when you're in your own environment. You're not going to have interruptions from the father showing up mm -hmm. and the mother showing up and, and other distractions going on. There's a lot of things going on, including a canine search at, at that scene to see if we can get a track, locate any evidence. Uh, so it, it's a busy scene uh, with up to 20 officers at a time. You said that the, the she had called... Michael's mother and father. Yes. Did, did did they come to the scene as well? Yes, they did. What? To tell me the how that 
played out? Well, I had to meet them down. This was a second floor apartment, so I'd go down to the parking lot and meet them. One of the one of the perimeter officers that had security on the scene would call me and tell me that that uh, hey, I've got a fellow saying that he's Mike Turpin's father here. You want to come down and talk to him? And of course I do. And and uh, and of course we can't let them anywhere near the crime scene. And you just trying to tell them, and I was trying my best to be optimistic. Uh, there was a good amount of blood and certainly some sign of a struggle there in the, in the doorway. And, but it wasn't enough that just put me over completely over the edge on saying, I've got a homicide here. But it did put me over enough to say, I'm going to treat this like a homicide until we figure it out. And so I find myself having to talk to Maggie and Don. And, That's the mother uh, and father. Yes. Maggie uh, struck me just right off the bat, and, and she's pretty no-nonsense kind of woman. And uh, I found myself kind of tap dancing uh, around because I want to assure her that we're doing as much as we can to locate her son uh, without scaring the the devil out of her, uh, that, that he's dead or been kidnapped or any number of other things. And so I was trying to downplay it. And, and later on, I heard Maggie make a statement to one of the people that she felt like I was playing tag with her. And, and, uh, and I I really, and you, and you were, yes. And I, I guess I was, but Mm -hmm. I felt bad that she read that that way. And, and, of course, I ran into the same problem with the dad. And that, I'll get into that here in a minute. Okay. So do you just tell the parents, uh, you know, once we find out something, we'll let you know? And, and then oh, you yeah, just you get, proceed on to go interview this spouse? You get every contact bit of information that you can and assure them that you'll be back with them, uh, certainly before the day is over, and, and let them know where you're at on the investigation. So you so you take the Elizabeth uh, wife and you say, well, let's go down and talk about it. And and I guess did you transport her? Did she just meet you there? Yeah, she uh, rode in in my detective cruiser. So did she seem kind of on edge or fidgety or not at all? Just laid back. Not at all. She was very matter of factly, and that's when she got into trying to give me some background on Mike Turpin. Her husband that that I've already learned was the president of the band fraternity at, at UK, graduated with honors, was an accountant, uh, regularly employed, uh, worked his way through school, uh, just a all American kind of boy is the picture I had at this point. But here I've got this 19 year old spouse of his uh, telling me on the way down to headquarters that he was a drug dealer, that he uh, was involved with organized crime, uh, organized crime syndicate called The Family, and uh, and that his street name was Shark, and he was dealing out the back door of McDonald's. Uh, and just once again, it was far too much information. And remember, I had just come off a six-year stint in narcotics, which was special investigations, and I'd never heard of no family and and really didn't know much about any kind of organized crime in Lexington, much less somebody's going to use 16-year-olds to sell drugs for them. So you're thinking, wow, I've got two very different pictures of this gentleman. Wife's telling me one thing. I'm kind of learning something else. So I guess you just are listening to it all and waiting to see how this plays out and who's telling the truth about about Mr. Turpin. Right. Well, and like I say, my my hackles were raised and I was suspicious. But the last thing you want to do uh, when you're investigating a crime like this is jump to conclusions. Uh, and you don't want to narrow the focus of your investigation. Okay, we know she's involved, even though we ha- don't have a clue how. She's involved, but uh, we know she's involved, and we're just going to work on her. Mm -hmm. Well, you're going to miss so many other things, including things that you'll need for trial later on, like uh, investigating exculpatory evidence and leads. What's exculpatory mean for the audience? Exculpatory is anything that that would 
possibly lead you to believe that the defendant is not guilty. So you interviewed you interviewed the wife, and did you have an opportunity to find? You said she didn't spend the night with her husband. Did you have an opportunity to find out where she might have been the night before? Yes, we did find out who she was with the night before. She was with some people from work where she worked as a car salesman that uh, that she had been to a place called the Circus Sunday night uh, earlier, and there was a big performance. It was a regular thing that they did there. What, what, what kind of a place is the Circus? Uh, it it kind of an after-hours club. They tried to cater to everyone, including underage, so they don't serve alcohol there, but they're really fast and loose about letting you go out to the car and do, or go in the bathroom for that matter and, and do whatever you want to do to get high. Uh, but this particular night was a, a drag show uh, night. It, it was made up to be a big deal and drew a very large How did she crowd. get to that? Uh, she was, well, at that time, she was still driving her car, uh, which was an older model, uh, 280Z Nissan. And, uh, but then her friend from work and, and the other friend, they would end up in another car off and on through the night. What was the, what was, what was the draw for her to go to this drag show? Well, her friend from work, Karen, uh, was actually going to be performing. Uh, she would be in drag attempting to look like Corey Hart, who was a popular singer back Male then. singer. Yes, male singer. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she did one of his songs in the performance. And dressed as Corey Hart? Yes. And was there any relationship between those two, you know? I think there was one that wanted uh, to be. And, and of course, what we found out as the investigation went on, it was probably pretty one-sided, but uh, that Karen certainly was a try's attention. You, you think that was a one-way relationship, really? Really. Uh-huh. Well, what was, what was Elizabeth Turpin's attraction to Karen? Well, Elizabeth, first of all, she got her drugs from Karen. That, that was probably what got the whole thing started. But then, you know, Elizabeth uh, was anything but stupid, uh, and she saw the attraction and uh, her modus operandi, so to speak, is, is that she would use people, just manipulate them to what she wanted to see happen. So Karen was, her, was basically her drug supplier, mm-hmm. and she, she continued to see her on a, I guess, a platonic relationship. As far as I know. Yeah, I see. So that's where she was that night. Well, now you mentioned a third person. Who's the third person that went with them to that club? Third person was Keith Bouchard. Uh, He was a handyman uh, detailer at the car dealership. So just three friends that worked together, going out under the pretenses of just having a good night out and watching Karen do her show. And Karen is hopeful that Elizabeth will be as interested as she is. Um, Yes. So at this point, when you have Elizabeth downtown, has Karen and Keith even been mentioned? Uh, Eventually in the statement, uh, Detective Maria Neal took her formal statement there at headquarters and uh, while she was still there, Karen actually showed up at the detective bureau. She wasn't called or anything, but she showed up uh, concerned about where Elizabeth was and what she was doing. So did Maria interview her? Uh, Karen, no. Okay. Was Karen eventually interviewed? Yes, she was. Uh, just as to their whereabouts that night before and, mm-hmm. and, and at different times about different topics uh, as we got the leads. Was there anything that happened during that evening at the circus that caused any kind of problem as it relates to Michael Turpin? Yes. uh, Mike adamantly did not want Elizabeth going out with her friends again, uh, especially on a work night. And and, uh, uh, so there was an argument before they even left. Elizabeth went out to the parking lot 
uh, and came back in acting very distraught, telling Karen and Keith that that damn husband of hers, Mike, had, had showed up and just messing with her and moved her car around. That's something that we suspected even at the end of the investigation that did not happen, but was just one of those things that Elizabeth was telling Karen and Keith uh, to get them on her side. She talked about Mike abusing her and mentally. And well, and I'm sure if Karen has a romantic interest in Elizabeth, she's probably very open to hearing whatever Elizabeth is going to tell her negative about her husband and not did did Michael know that Karen had a romantic interest in his wife? I don't know if he perceived that or not. Uh, I think they were over at the apartment often enough with Mike that certainly if he was paying attention, probably would have picked up on mm -hmm. it. But sadly, we didn't get to talk to Mike. Was there any conversation at the circus that you discovered through your investigation between uh, Elizabeth and Karen and Keith that would have caused Karen and Keith to um, want to protect uh, Elizabeth or to do anything to make sure that Michael didn't do anything to her? Oh, yeah. They they had been, Elizabeth had been talking for some several days now uh, about how unhappy she was with Mike and I think she dropped a few times the fact that he had a life insurance policy on him. And uh, she would say things like, I sure wish I could just hang out with you guys all the time. Just different things like that. And then she talked excessively about how abusive Mike was and how basically a bad person he was. Was she afraid to go home that night from the circus? I don't know if she told them that or not. That did not come up. So when they left the circus that night, what did your, what did your investigation reveal? Well, in, in order to kind of keep this thing cohesive, I've got to jump around a little bit. But I think by the second day of the investigation, uh, Sergeant Dan Gibbons gets a call from, from a person that identifies a drug dealer that they had cruised by his house that night, that Sunday night. They apparently had left the circus for a while and then went back. Uh, and they were asked, well, I think they bought some drugs. He was Karen's drug connection, but, uh, they asked him for a gun. He told me he didn't have one, so they did not get a gun. But. So you, so you so, interview Karen. I'm sorry, you interview Elizabeth, and do you just at this point do you just let her go? Is it we're well, just hearing her story, and you're still at a loss, thinking, well, wh where's this gentleman at? Well, it's a it's a fine line that you, even though we're suspicious of her, uh, we don't want her to what they say in the law business, lawyer up on us. Mm -hmm. uh, so you try to keep things on a low key so you can keep them talking. And she was a talker, so we wanted her to talk. So when you ended the investigation that evening or the, the interview with her, did you just leave it as, we'll keep looking? Or at this point, at the end of that, were you certainly now thinking there's a lot more to the story? Well, as far as she's concerned, we're very uh, concerned about Mike's well-being, and we're going to do everything we can to find him and help him. Uh, so uh, you, you need to stay in touch with us. If we don't call you, you call us and uh, let us know where you're going to be, because <laughs> we wouldn't let her go back to her apartment. We did let her go get a couple of things out of the apartment under supervision. But. So then you send her on her way, and I guess what happens next in the investigation? Are you all just hoping he either turns up or, I mean, do you just wait? We're getting uh, background information through all of this. We're, we're talking to people like Karen Brown, and, and uh, we didn't talk to Keith for a while. We just didn't manage to run across them. Uh, so the main people we were talking to are people like all of Mike's friends from college, uh, band guys. We kept, well, both male and female friends from, from that age, and we're getting this perfect picture of, of Mike Turpin as the boy next door. No suspicion of drugs. Uh, I think every one of the, the women in, in his uh, group 
probably would have loved to have dated him, except he was just kind of backwards. You had to just about hit him over the head to get him to to pay attention to you, and that's exactly what Elizabeth did, as we found out later on. How did they meet? Uh, they met from band. Uh, Mike was a senior and the president of the band fraternity, and Elizabeth come in as a young freshman, and uh, she wanted to be in the band, and so she was trying out for a flag girl position. She immediately approached Mike and started flirting with him, and, and Mike was not used to that. Uh, she got his attention very quickly. Matter of fact, he fell for her. Yes. Pretty hard right away. Oh, yeah. So after everybody leaves the police department that day, you continue to interview. So what's the next development in this case? Well, we're, uh, and, and of course, the last thing I do on those days of investigation is go by and see the parents or whoever our loved one contact is. And so, uh, and and that was an, another one where I didn't hit it off too well with mom and dad. I go to uh, Don Turpin's house. And by now, you know, Elizabeth told us all these stories. And all she added, too, that Mike's little brother also helped him deal drugs. And so I find myself in in Don Turpin's family room, vice president of a, of a large bank here in town, and I find myself asking him about his, his sons dealing drugs. Well, I, I'd say I came very close to getting punched, uh, but I was simply following up on leads I had to do. I probably could have explained myself a little bit more. Then again, you don't want to give out too much information either. So what's, what's the conversation with uh, Maggie and Don? Well, just to let them know where, where we're at, uh, that we're still looking for Mike, that we're still treating it as a homicide investigation. And quite frankly, we're kind of out of things that we could do for the, that day. It was about 1130 midnight. How many days there. into the investigation were you at this point? That's the first day. So you did a lot on that first day. Yeah, that was a 12-hour or so day. Maybe okay, next. So you go next. home. You wake go up home, tomorrow. Try to get us some sleep. Uh, we go into work. We've already got people lined up to come in and interview. I personally had a, a friend of, of Mike's from the band era coming in to see me. And uh, I'm not long into that interview before a detective interrupts the interview and and gets me out of the interview room and tells me that they found a body out at Lakeside Golf Course. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. This podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.